You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. It's Nikayla here. And this week in the guest chair, we have Jessica Nabongo. Jessica is a wanderlust, writer, entrepreneur, public speaker, and travel expert, most widely known for being the first Black woman on record to visit every country in the world. At her core, Jessica is a dreamer looking to craft a life and career that interconnects her passions and talents. A first-generation American, Jessica was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan to Ugandan parents. As you'll hear in today's episode, as her career path changed throughout her life, Jessica realized that travel, writing, and photography continued to show up as vehicles of self-expression and were essential parts of her life, leading to the creation of her blog, The Catch Me If You Can. She also created Jet Black, a boutique luxury travel company that hosts group trips and curates itineraries to countries in Africa, Central and South America, and the Caribbean. Her work as a travel writer and entrepreneur has led to speaking opportunities around the world. And she started this all as a side hustler. In this episode, she shares how and why she started the Catch Me If You Can blog and why it became a side hustle, how she uses her blog to share her travel adventures and build a global community, her experiences founding a boutique travel agency and the effect the pandemic had on that business, and how she uses her story to educate and inspire others to travel and experience the world around them through her new book, The Catch Me If You Can, and so much more. Let's jump right into it with Jessica. So welcome to the guest chair, Jessica. Thank you for having me, Nikayla. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm so excited for you. First of all, I mean, I can't wait to go to this book tour. What you're doing is amazing. But let's go back a little bit. So you were born in Detroit. Um, You were raised with your Ugandan parents. Now, how did that upbringing shape your love for travel and who you are as a person? Yeah, I mean, I think in such a major way, largely because um, my parents love to travel. And so from four, my first international trip was when I was four. And my parents just made vacation a regular part of our lives. So like every summer, whether it was international or domestic, like we went somewhere or we did something. So that was really important to them to have like a summer vacation. Um, So I think that's really what started to shape it. And then also... I grew up in a home with two sets of encyclopedias <laughs> and <laughs> an atlas. I know that a encyclopedia globe. life. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, I, I miss encyclopedias. I used to just sit around the house. Like I, I have distinct memories of sitting in the basement, just like flipping through <laughs> encyclopedias. Um, but yeah, so being around so many books and just never feeling like the world was only in Detroit is really what helped to shape shape that for me. And then beyond that, I would say my parents never put boundaries on me. Mm. So if I wanted to do something, they let me do it. So at three, I started piano and then I did tap and ballet and played the clarinet and the percussion and basketball and softball and tennis. And, you know, I did all of these different things. And when I wanted to quit, they let me quit. So it was like, I, they really allowed me to like fuel my curiosity and like do things that interested me. And then if I didn't like it, they weren't like, no, you have to do it because you, you asked and you know, there was never any of that. So I was very like flighty, I guess, Um, (laughs) but but, you know, but still very grounded academically. And so it kind of all worked out. Well, shout out to them just nurturing that spirit of exploration. I think sometimes the word quit gets this bad connotation, but actually you can try things out and decide it's not for you and that should be OK. So yeah, exactly. do you remember your first vacation, though? It was just kind of like you went on so many growing up that you don't even remember. The first, I mean, like, I remember I have pictures, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. like, I don't know that I have, like, distinct memories, but, like, four, we went to Canada's Wonderland. Uh. Um, when I was six, my eldest sister graduated high school, and so her high school graduation gift was a trip to 
Disney World. Is that the one in Florida? Whatever is in yes, Florida. Yes, Orlando. Yeah, yep. Disney World. Yeah, Disney World. Um, and so we I do remember that because It's a Small World was my favorite ride. <laughs> uh, so I do Very remember fitting. that. And, right? And I remember being on planes and like, first of all, the flight from Detroit to Orlando, they served you food and economy back in the day. And I remember, you know, they would give you the wings as the child and like had all the coloring books. I do remember that. So that's probably like my first vacation memory when I was sick. I love the fact that you remember those, you know? So you have a career now, your life and what you do for a living, I'm sure you could never have imagined. And I want to know, like, what was your original career path before you discovered that you could do this for a living? Yeah. So when um, so in undergrad, I studied English literature and uh, I minored in advertising communications. So I actually wanted to go to fashion school. But my mother told me that fashion is a hobby and she forbade me from going to FIT. (laughs) Yeah. So I had been designing in high school, but she was like, absolutely not. So I was like, well, I'm going to school in New York and I'm studying English literature. How do you like that? Um, So it was definitely like rebellion. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But everything worked out. Um, When I graduated, I graduated a semester early and I went and I started working for Pfizer doing pharmaceutical sales. And it was great. And I was making a ton of money and I was living my best life on vacation (laughs) and, you know, going to happy hours every day. But ultimately, like I wasn't fulfilled. So I ended up leaving that job, shaving my head and moving to Japan to teach English. My family thought I was crazy. Um, um, <laughs> well, you can't just gloss over that. OK, so did the shaving <laughs> the head have to do with the moving? Like, did those two? Yeah, go because um, I had a pixie cut at the time and I used to go. I was one of those girls. Every week, 5 a.m., I was at my salon and I didn't know how to do my own hair. And I was like, ain't nobody going to do this black hair in Japan. And so because I wasn't living in like a big city, I was living 20 minutes from Kyoto. So I was like, I just got to shave my head because what else am I going to do? You know, if I get braids and then I look crazy after three months. Um, So I just literally shaved my head because. I'm such a practical person that that was practically speaking what I needed to do. You got rid of any like weight and you were like, I'm going to be flying free. So when you went to Japan to teach English, did you know that you wanted to start traveling at that point, like just traveling the world and start, you know, um, going after this goal to visit all 195 countries? No. So Japan was my 10th country. So I was, um, relatively well traveled by that point like i'd been to a lot of u.s states 10 10 um countries and i think like one territory okay. so i had already like traveling was a pretty regular part of my life anyway um and then in japan like i went to hong kong like let me tell you something the japanese work so hard so there's just not a lot of vacations oh, man. so yeah so i only left japan one well twice i went home for christmas and then i went to hong kong during one of the like national holidays or whatever but so what happened after japan i decided i was going to the london school of economics in october to start my master's program and i left japan in february and so during that time i decided that i was going to just travel because I had savings and that was 2009. So I started my travel blog to catch me if you can in 2009. So that's the thing. It's like, I'm not new to this. Uh (laughs) 2009, I feel like was a big blogging year. I mean, that was when like people were really ramping up. What led you to start blogging? So I have always been a writer. Like I've literally been writing since I was very, very young. It's so cute because I found like old things that I used to write, like Uh, little essays and poems. That's always so nice. Right? And and so I started a blog when I moved to Japan because Apple, I don't know if anybody remembers, but Apple used to have blogs actually. And so I had an Apple blog. No, I didn't um, remember that. Yeah. So that was like, you know, alongside blogger and all that other stuff, Apple had its own blogging, whatever universe. So I started that when I was in Japan, just to like update friends and family and like show pictures and tell stories. I'm like dying to figure out how to unearth that material. 
Um, and so I then decided to transit. So it's funny because my friends, anytime people hit me up, they were like, where are you? Which is the <laughs> same now. People are always like, where are you? And so people would say, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? And so it was this whole thing that like Jessica is always somewhere. And that's why I started the Catch Me If You Can. So I wanted catchmeifyoucan.com, but it was being used by the movie at the time. So I added the, and so that's how it became the Catch Me If You Can. Now, once you got to the London School of Economics, did you keep on doing it? Did you decide I'm going to skip over that whole master's program altogether? <laughs> no, so I was still yeah. I was still blogging, I was still traveling, and I was working my butt off in school. I'm I'm like such a nerd. I always say I'm a really cool nerd, but I am a nerd. So I love school. Um, I would love to do another degree. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm obsessed with academia. <laughs> I want to be a professor so bad. So anyway, um, so yeah, I was still traveling when I was in London and, you know, mm -hmm. it's Europe, so it's super quick and easy to get everywhere and they have all the cheap airlines. So I did a lot of travel while I was there. And then when I finished school, couldn't find a job, was dating this Italian guy at the time. And so he got a job in Benin. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll go with you because I have nothing better to do with my time. <laughs> and that's literally how I ended up moving to Benin with this man. What? And uh, yeah, so we were there for like six months. And then he ended up moving to like rural Kenya. Hmm. And I was over living in rural Africa. So I was like, all right, I'm going back to Europe. Bye. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I moved to Rome and I mean, we were still together for a little bit, but ultimately we broke up because he lived in Kenya and I lived in Italy and it was just like, this isn't going to work. So I was living in Rome working for the UN. Yeah. So that's now we're at like 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and so I stayed in Rome for until December, 2012. And then I ended up quitting, but they didn't want me to quit. So I was like, okay, so I'll still work, yeah. but I'm not going to live in Rome. And that was the start of like my digital nomad life before it was a thing. Cause this now, this is 2012, beginning of 2013. Mm -hmm. So this is a long time ago. Um, and so that's what I did. So I traveled, I spent six weeks in South America. Um, I remember I was flying home on Christmas Eve from Rome to Detroit. And I remember being in line and booking my flight um, <laughs> to Buenos Aires. Cause I had a friend living in Buenos Aires yeah. and he was like, yeah, come cool. Uh, so yeah, so then I was just living like in South America kind of and working for my team so, in Rome and just making it happen. So you pioneered this whole work from home life. You've been about it before pandemic. And that's so amazing because what I love about your story too is like you are traveling and at the same time you're working for the UN. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, no, I'm not like freelancing here. Oh, I have a job at the UN. And then you are so good. Like you're doing your work so well. So that's a key in side hustling. Like you got to do the yes. main thing very, yes. very well. So you do, you are such um, a valued employee that you're able to negotiate working from anywhere now how long did you do that before you just you realized that you could do this full-time like bet on yourself be a full-time travel photographer entrepreneur lifestyle influencer everything uh so let's see so i was doing the digital nomad thing for about eight nine months then i got another job back in rome it was too good to like not take mm -hmm. it yeah. Then I was back in Rome for about nine, 10 months. And then 2014, I quit for real, for real. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I celebrated my 30th birthday for two months. And then mm -hmm. I ended up getting a, a nine to five back in DC, working for a consulting firm. Cause I really wanted to be back in the U S I'd been abroad for seven years. So I was working, it was a great job. Um, I was living on Capitol Hill. It was a very nice lifestyle and I hated it. Like, you know, nice. that was, it was after the summer of Mike Brown and Ferguson. And it was just like that racial reckoning. And, yep. you know, the thing is being black in America, like being born in America and growing up black, we don't realize all that is on our shoulders because it's so normal. But when you leave for seven years and you come back, you realize very quickly how heavy it is and how abnormal it is and how we legitimately are being treated as second class citizens. And so for me, I was just like, oh, this, I'm not about this life. It was my first time working in an American office space and it was horrible. I ended up quitting that job after a year. I sued them for racial discrimination. Wow. Um, and I never for worked you. for anybody again after that. 
Yeah, like it was wild. I was like, this is crazy town. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I started Jet Black, my travel agency during that time. And the way I started that was I had a friend who's a famous rapper and he (laughs) had a honeymoon (laughs) coming up. (laughs) I'm not going to name drop because he's so private, (laughs) but, um, but I planned his honeymoon. And then when I was doing it, as I was planning, I was like, yo, I could totally do this. And that's how I started Jet Black. But specifically with Jet Black, I wanted to focus on sending people to countries in Africa, Central and South America, and the Caribbean. So, because okay. really, like, to try to change the narrative about these com- countries. Yes. And so, so I, like, when I quit my job, I put my stuff in storage in D.C. And then I went to Southeast Asia for several weeks. I don't even know how long I was out there. Um, and by this time, so I'm still blogging. And I think by this time, I was probably around, like, 50 something countries. Okay. So this is like 2015. So I had started my my side hustle. So this was like a boutique hustle. luxury um travel concierge kind of thing. Yep. Yep. And then we started doing group trips, which okay. were called Jet Black Johns. Those were lit. <laughs> it sounds lit. Uh, what yes. I like about what you were doing, you know, a lot of times when you do visit different countries in Africa and you see like all the luxurious places that you can stay, we are not there. You know, I experienced this oh. on my honeymoon. Like someone staring at us like we didn't belong. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah, it's wild. It's wild. But then like a lot of the people who work there are then so excited, right? Because yes. I remember yeah. going to the Four Seasons in um, Tanzania in the mm-hmm. Serengeti for my Tanzania birthday. It was in Tanzania that we went for a okay. honeymoon. They were staring at me like me and, me and my husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like the, the, the workers are like so excited because so they're like, excited. oh my God. So, so yeah, I mean, that's definitely the experience in a, in a number of different um, African countries, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, your story, you sound so fearless. Um, A lot of people, you know, I hear the refrain when they come on this show and there's a lot of hesitation about around quitting, around just living a life where there's no blueprint to that career path. Did you feel any of that at all? No, you know what? I am. (laughs) I just be out here for real. (laughs) And, you know, for me, like, and what you spoke about earlier is like Uh when you have that main job, you got to be good at what you do. Be excellent. Even when even when I was doing jobs that I didn't love, I was always excellent. Mm -hmm. The one thing about me throughout my life from when I was a child, I've always had a commitment to excellence. I don't want to just half ass anything, you know, so to that end. I've always created these safety nets. So like when I left Pfizer, they begged me not to leave. That's a safety net. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, "Mm, I'm still going to go. But (laughs) if I got to Japan and I didn't like it, the relationship that I built and the work that I did, they would happily take me back. Same with the UN. I quit the UN three different times. You know what I mean? (laughs) And they were always very happy to have me back. You know, when I I was like, quit, and then I'd go travel, and then I'd be like, I'm broke. And then I'd go back like, can I please have a job again? And they would take me back. So for me, my fearlessness, it actually comes from the fact that I'm type A and I'm a planner. Mm -hmm. And so I created all of these safety nets. And so like, even now I recently, now I split my time between LA and Detroit. And even if LA doesn't work out or, I mean, I moved here just to hang out with my friends really, (laughs) but like, I still have, you know, I still have, um, property that I own in Detroit. So like I, and it's paid off completely. So it's like, I'll always have somewhere to go. That's a safety net. So I don't think I know that everything's going to work out, but let's say in an alternate universe, things didn't work out. I have a place to go that I own because I've created that safety net. So it's like Mm -hmm. my fearlessness comes from the fact that I'm a planner. This makes me so excited because I want to show more of this, you guys, like this idea that all of us out here who are, you know, following an unbeaten path, like we're so like we're risk takers and we're all of this, like actually a lot of us are planners. <laughs> a lot of us make sure that we have something to fall back on. Um, did that include finances for you? So for were you stacking, you know, making sure, well, you said you were broke and you had to go back to the UN for a little bit, but each time <laughs> where you but whenever building up a cushion. I say, <laughs> when I say I'm broke, 
<laughs> I'm, I don't have zero dollars. Like right. I hear people with these stories of like, I had $20 in my bank account. <laughs> I legitimately don't know that life because like for me, you know, okay. When I really, really didn't have any money broke was Mm -hmm. probably like, I'm down to my last two K, but like my mom is also there. (laughs) You know what I mean? So like, maybe I'm down to my last two K or something. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely includes finances beyond that. I had, I always had good credit. Mm -hmm. So I've always had incredibly high credit limits. So at times when I needed to sort of bridge the gap. Yep. I had, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars worth of credit limit to bridge mm-hmm. the gap. Now, I was still smart in understanding yeah. how to use that and knowing like, okay, I'm charging this and while I kind of can't afford it, I know in like 6 months I can get a job and then I can mm-hmm. pay this off, you know? Cuz now I don't think I cuz one thing I didn't do is I wouldn't use my credit card to like buy a bag, right? Right. Like to buy a Chanel bag or to buy a pair of shoes. I would never do that. What I use my credit card for was like a trip, (laughs) you know, or something like that. Um, And I think that's really important, right? I don't think you should buy material goods Mm -hmm. on your credit cards. That to me, it doesn't make sense because you can't afford it. So like, why? Like you can't afford it. You're trying to maybe look like you can afford it, but you can't. So I think um, I think credit cards are great. I use them. I only use credit cards because I'm obsessed with points, and I'm like, I I'm know. Not using I was going to say unless like, you are, you know, getting those points and paying it right off. But I hear what you're saying, and and I love that you share that, like that, you know, joking about being broke. Like, no, in all honesty, like. I'm still a planner. I'm still making sure I have that safety cushion. So tell us how Jet Black did. You know, how long were you running that business? Is it still going? Like, how long did you do that before you kind of shifted full time to the catch me if you can and the catch? Yeah. So Jet Black did really, really well. We had write ups and Forbes and Honey Nest Traveler and a bunch of other press. Um, it did really, really great. And then um, came the pandemic. I mean, you know, like I literally, so March 13th is my memory of when the world shut down. And um, we had a trip the first week in April in Jordan and like obviously didn't know what was going on. So I'm like, it's fine. It's fine. Everyone thought it was fine fine before. Yeah. It's fine. And then it was like, no, 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 it's not fine. But you know, it was like, we were just learning. Uh And honestly, what happened was some of the people who were going, some who are very well known, and they are lucky that I'm the kind of person that would never put people on blast because their behavior was so disgusting. And they had no, so disgusting. And they had no grace for me. And, you know, like I, I lost money. I lost a lot of money because we paid vendors Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's all these transaction fees, PayPal fee. I can't get any of that back. And they just lacked grace and it was disgusting. And again, some of them incredibly well-known. A lot of people listening know exactly who these women Mm -hmm. are. And they're just lucky that I'm a really nice person. in, In terms of like, um, asking for their money back or, it was it was demanding their money back in a really short period of time when we we didn't cl- know what was going on. Like, you know, this is one of those things when you sign a contract, this is what they call it, force majeure. You know what I mean? It's just but they were just being ridiculous. And the thing was, at the end of the day, it was stressing me to a crazy point that I was like, here, take it. Like, I'm not about to argue with you. I'm not yeah. about to send spreadsheets and show you like all of the money that I have paid out and I cannot get back. Yeah. You're being unreasonable, even though these billion dollar airlines are not giving you refunds, but you want to keep your neck, your foot on my neck, this little tiny, little tiny black business. I got it. So I lost a lot of money on that. And honestly, after dealing with them, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not dealing with customers. Yes. So I was like, bye, Jet Black. We had our moment. It was beautiful. <laughs> but I was just like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And so I let that be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so as far as the catch me if you can, that really came about, obviously I had the blog right. and Jet Black was doing so well. Like 
I decided, oh, well, let me try and focus on my personal brand. So I was okay. still doing Jet Black, but I made like a conscious decision to focus on my personal brand because I was already working with like Condé Nast Traveler and a bunch of other outlets. I was writing um, Bloomberg, I think in 2017, called me a distinguished travel hacker. So I was getting a lot of press and doing a lot as a travel expert. Um, so I didn't have a huge following, but I had knowledge, right? I, I think at that point it had been like six. 70 countries. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of knowledge, obviously. And so that's when I really made that pivot into like the travel expert space. And then as my audience grew, people started to call it the travel influencer. So that's really how I ended up in that space. With spring in the air, it is a time of renewal and growth, you guys, personally and professionally. As your small business grows, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. I found my last two amazing social media and content managers on LinkedIn Jobs, and I cannot wait to put up another post to hire my next one. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash hustle pro. That's linkedin.com slash hustle pro to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Today's podcast is supported by the podcast Journey to Launch. Host and personal finance educator Jamila Soufrant shares practical and tactical ways that you can achieve your dreams of financial freedom and financial independence. From learning strategies for paying off debt and investing to hearing inspirational stories and real life interviews from people who have been able to retire early or travel the world, this podcast will help you live the life you've been dreaming of. Featured by the New York Times, Money Magazine, and Apple Podcasts as a money podcast to listen to, it's the perfect addition to your podcast playlist. And let me tell you, my favorite episodes are Jamila's solo episodes because she really does a deep dive on her own personal finance journey. So subscribe and listen to Journey to Launch Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Fun fact, Jamila and her husband saved and invested $169,000 in two years. And she also shares that that journey and all the behind the scenes of that process on the podcast. So again, subscribe and listen to Journey to Launch podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. At what point did the goal of hitting every country come about? Yeah. So I've been wanting to travel to every country in the world since my early 20s, but mm -hmm. I always thought that I would do it by like my 40s or my 50s, but it wasn't like I had a deadline. I was just every year I would try to go to like a couple of new countries and I kept it. I like kept a review of it on my blog. Like I would fill in my map like, oh, this year I went to X number of new countries. <laughs> then in 2017, I found out about an American woman that had been to every country in the world and she got a Guinness record for doing it the fastest. And I was like, wait, people care. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so I started digging into it and realized there was like this whole world of country counters. Um, and so at the time, that was 2017, February, I was in Bali. And that's really where I decided Bali. Indonesia was number country number 60 for me. Yep. And there I just decided, you know what? I want to visit every country in the world by my 35th birthday. And I want to be the first black woman to do it. Cause there was one black man who'd done it. Slawek mm -hmm. Maturi. And at the time, less than 150 people had done it in the entire world ever in history. So it's a really rare thing to do. Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's definitely crazy. not something that you hear about. And it's, it's something that 
it's one of those things that I'm glad you have done it because it shows it's possible. It's one of those things a lot of people probably think is not possible. Like, you know, when do you find the time? How do you fund this? And how do you even get to every country? <laughs> like some countries, like, are they so rural? You know what I mean? So those are some of the things that people, the limitations that pop into your mind. Oh, it's not easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> don't let me let you think that it was right, easy. Right. No, no. I didn't hard. think it was easy. <laughs> Believe you me. Believe you me. Um, it's so very expensive. <laughs> it's very, you know, like you said, there's countries that are very difficult to get to, and it is physically exhausting. Yes. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, congrats. Now, you are coming out with your book. Um, and, you know, tell everyone when it drops so that we can go ahead and pre-order and, you know, have it when it drops. <laughs> yes, you can pre-order it wherever books are sold. It's called Yay. The Catch Me If You Can. It's being published by National Geographic and it comes out June 14th. What? Well, first of all, that's amazing. I did not know it was from National Geographic. Like, that is the bomb, girl. Yes, yes, yes. That's a, you know what, like that, I had spoken to a lot of, um, a lot of the major publishers, Uh but Nat Geo reached out in August of 2020 after reading about me in a Washington Mm -hmm. Post article. And, and it's been great. Like they've been amazing partners. My editor, Allison Johnson is who reached out and she Mm -hmm. like, it's just been amazing working with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, also the book has uh, over 300 images. And in the book, I tell 100 stories from 100 countries. And just to have it through National Geographic, uh, I don't I don't think there was a better home. And the other day, I'm like getting emotional. <laughs> the other day, like I was looking at my spine and I'm like, Jessica Nabongo, National Geographic. Like it's so... It's so incredible just to like see that because, you know, we all know what that like what that Nat Geo looks like. Right. And so to see to see my name, the title, you know, this website that I built on my own in 2009 to see that name, the Catch Me If You Can with my name and the Nat Geo logo. It's just. What is happening? I don't know, but I'm excited. (laughs) That is just such a I mean, how perfect that is just I can't even. How did you decide which countries and which experiences you wanted to recount in this book? Oh, gosh. Right. Um, It was very hard. It was so hard. (laughs) First of all, writing a book is like my editor is always like, so what was harder traveling to every country in the world or writing the book? I said, writing the book, hands down. No question. No question. I believe it. I believe it. Um, So how did I decide? You know, I really... What I love about what I've been able to do on my platform is like really change the way people think about certain places. Mm -hmm. And so for in everything I do, I really have this commitment to like reducing bias through storytelling. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I remember I think I was in Pakistan. I don't remember where I was, but I posted something about Islamophobia, you know, Mm -hmm. and there was this whole conversation around that. Um, I've talked a lot about traveling while on my period. There's stories in the book about traveling while on my period, which is something that we should talk about. I mean, more than 50% of the world are women, um, most of whom menstruate or have at some point in their lives. Um, So I really, I wanted to, I wanted to talk about countries that people often don't think about Mm -hmm. because I wanted to show the beauty. I wanted to show the humanity. So places like Yemen, Afghanistan, North Korea, South South Sudan, really showing the humanity in these places. Um, There's really funny stories. So, you know, I (laughs) wanted to like, I love to make people laugh. So I wanted to do that. Um, And there's really some, there's some heartbreaking stories in there too, because that's the, the reality of the world that we live in. So there, it's wide ranging. I know people are already about to hit me up like, why isn't this country in here? Why? (laughs) Uh, Let me tell you. I was we wondering had to add- because at one point I thought it was every country and I'm like, how many pages is this book going to be? So I know that would be impossible. So look, yeah. 
we had to add 52 pages to my book. I think it was 52. So the yes. book is 416 pages. Okay. Wow. We couldn't do anything else. So this y'all. is going to like, be this is a statement piece. This is going to be your coffee table book, you guys. You put it on your, you know, like get rid of all those Tom Ford books that everyone is buying for their. <laughs> Get rid of the Chanel books. She and said it, not me, y'all. She office. said it, not me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly what no it shame, is. What, no I will say, <laughs> what I will say is people are going to have the desire to open it and just go to random countries. I'm begging you guys. Yeah. One good time. Read it cover to cover or listen to the audiobook. So the audiobook is fun. The audiobook is I'm super, all about super the audio fun. Book too. Yep. Yeah. So so buy the hard copy and put it on your table and use that as like a reference if you're going to a specific country. But listen to the audiobook or read the printed book um, cover to cover because it's also my memoir. So it's like a memoir slash travel log slash travel tips and my commentary on the world. So there really is like a story running through. Mm-hmm. So I do think it's good to, I encourage yeah. everyone to read it cover to cover. <laughs> well, I will definitely be, this is my, this, my little bookcase has you oh, know, all I my favorite, it. like everyone who I know who comes out with a book or interview, like, Get good with money. I see yeah, <laughs> it, it comes to my little, my house. Okay. And what I love about this too, is oftentimes when we're getting ready to travel, we're looking to that friend. Have you been here? What was it like? We all do that. And now we know we all have a black woman who has been there. So she can give us the black woman experience of what it was like. What do you think about lately? Most recently, there's been some kind of horror stories about black women who are traveling by themselves. And I think it's so unfortunate because some of these stories that I've heard, I'm like, I've been to the same country and had a wonderful experience. And I don't want it to, especially when it's a black country, like I don't want this to discourage us from ever going to this country. At the same time, we do need to be on guard, right? We do need to make sure we're aware of what could happen. So what's your take, you know, now that you've been to every country on um, traveling by yourself and are there any places that you're just like, yeah, it is, it is risky for us to go there. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think I think we have to take the negative with a grain of salt the same way we take the positive, right? Mm-hmm. When something negative happens, we tend to amplify it, right? There's all these studies that show negative news travels faster than positive news. Especially when it so becomes we, a Twitter thread that keeps just uh, being retweeted and retweeted. So also, I one of the things that I always say to my friends is that I would not participate in my own oppression. And so I think we have to be really, really careful about these ideas, right? These yeah. ideas of, well, I'm a black woman and everything is more dangerous for me. And I don't I don't personally feel that way. Um, I'm not afraid of human beings. So for me, I don't have fear when I travel, because if I'm not afraid of people, what is there to be afraid of? You know, and I travel with positive energy and like. I've had some bad things happen to me in Miami. A cop pulled a gun on me in Paris. Someone tried to steal my phone in Rome. A taxi driver tried to kiss me in my mouth. And then with like security in Pakistan, like it was just really horrific. Like they were groping me thinking I was moving drugs. Mm. Those are four instances. I've been to 195 countries plus 10 territories. And I've been to 50 countries more than once. So I have a lot, a huge data set, if you will. And now I'm not saying all of that to invalidate anybody else's experience. But what I'm saying is like, it's a bad thing that happened, but it is not the norm. It Mm -hmm. is not the norm. A norm is based on the amount of times that it happens. A black woman having something negative happening to her when she travels is not the norm. There are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of black women that have traveled on vacation by themselves and have amazing time. I've been to 89 countries on six continents by myself, the Middle East, Africa, East Asia, everywhere, 89 countries by myself. Nothing happened to me when I was alone. You know what I mean? So I think we really have to take those negative experiences with a grain of salt. And I really do think there's something to being positive. If you're going to a place and you're all like scary, you're like, oh, my God, this is going to happen. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah, and you have yeah. that energy, you're going to bring it to you. I've never used a hotel safe in my entire life. Oh, wow. Not one time. Now that, not, that's not a fact. You need another book about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Not one time. And I've never had anything stolen yeah. from me while I'm on so vacation. I'm glad you stated that because if there's anything I hope you guys take away from Jessica, it's that point. I want you to be inspired by her journey and I want you to feel free to go anywhere. So the travel groups are great. Nowadays, it might be hard, you know, um, getting it back ramped up and don't wait don't wait on other people to go on that trip you've been dreaming of um don't wait on a partner don't wait on your friend group go go just go yeah and go with light energy go with welcoming energy Mm -hmm. go with an energy of oh my god yes this is about to be the best experience i'm ever gonna have in my life you know what i mean when you tell yourself that you move Absolutely. with a different pep in your step. And don't go with the mindset that everyone's going to be out to get you. Because in actuality, when it comes to tourists, um, most countries are not trying to mess up their bag. Most countries want you to have a good time. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. And, you know, as someone who is from places like, you know, I was born in Jamaica, grew up in the Bronx. And, you know, anytime I hear people say disparaging things about either place, I'm just like... That's not the reality. That's not going to be your reality. That's not most people's reality. And, you know, you just really have to um, not anchor in the negative. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what it is. I couldn't have said it better myself. We cannot anchor. We cannot anchor in the negative. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing I want to say is like a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, every acknowledgement of your race is not racism. (laughs) Yes. Some people are curious. Some people want to take your picture. Some people will stare at you. It's not necessarily racism. Like some people legitimately have never seen a black person. That is a fact. They've only seen them on TV. You know what I mean? So we have to also remove that thing of like, everybody's racist. Do we live in a white supremacist world? Yes, we do. We all know that. But it's like, you got to let that go. It's much, much worse in the U.S. than anywhere else. So you got to, like, let that go and, like, release that burden. You know, put it back on when you're at home. Take it off when you get on the plane, you know? I always think it's so funny when, you know, the Black guys in in my life will be like, oh, I went to this country, and, you know, they were taking photos of me because they thought I was a basketball player. And I'm like, really? They thought you were? (laughs) Like, really? They thought you were a is that what have fun? <laughs> so before we transition to the lightning round, can you tell us a little bit more about the business of being a travel influencer? I don't even know if you want to use that word, but you know, how how would you classify yourself in? Can you tell us a little bit more about that business, that world of getting paid to create content and getting paid fairly? Yeah. So I like to think of myself as just a liver and lover of life. I don't have a career. I just do things that bring money into my life. Um, so I, I have like different that. I'm taking streams. that energy. I'm taking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because for me, like career doesn't matter to me. And anybody you talk to who's known me for 20, 30 years is mm-hmm. like, yeah, she don't care. Like, I don't. That's why I've been able to quit jobs because I'm just like, I first and foremost, I value my freedom. Mm -hmm. So I can't get caught up doing too many things because I still want to feel free, you know? So that's the big thing. But yes, I do create content for brands from time to time. I will say, quite frankly, it's something that, um, it's something that I'm divesting from largely because, um, that algorithm is wearing me out. And uh, oh I'm, my gosh, Whew, I'm so out. tired of it. Crazy. I'm so tired of it. <laughs> and I just, you know, I was chatting with a friend last night. I don't like what Instagram is becoming. Like it's becoming this mm-hmm. thing where everybody's doing voiceovers and all of these things only for engagement. Mm-hmm. Whereas like it used to be, you would, you would post what you like. Yeah. Now it's like you're posting for attention. You're posting to feed the algorithm beast. So for me, I don't even like where it's going. So I don't work with a lot of brands anymore, um, largely because my rate is too high for most of them. But um, (laughs) (laughs) say it, you know, and for me, it's like there has to be very crystal clear alignment with the brands that I'm working with, you know. Um, So I do bigger things like I just did a campaign. Um, I did a commercial with Lexus that was produced by CNN. Uh, I try to do bigger things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, And also still using those opportunities to tell the stories of other people. So that 
I got to tell, um, use that opportunity to tell the stories of Native women in New Mexico. So really for me, it's like, they have to be so intentional and, um, and it has to pay my rate. Like yeah. that's one thing. All my friends know about me. I don't play when it comes to work. Like <laughs> I know that I know my value in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's not just, oh, black girl who travels. No. no. My value in the marketplace is connected to Jessica Nabongo, who I am, yep. the brand that I have built, the clear the clarity in my brand messaging and who I am and what I want to put out in the world and because I'm very crystal clear about that I'm crystal clear about how much it costs to work with me and I think and I think that's the thing it goes Mm -hmm. back to the commitment to excellence yeah I have been excellent in everything that I have done, which is why I have the amazing partners that I have who I work with over and over and over again, which is why, mm-hmm. you know, I have National Geographic as my publishing partner, um, mm-hmm. because that's that's where the alignment has brought me. So, um, so, so yeah, do I hope you, that answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever worry about financial security, given that kind of freedom of thought and, you know, your ability to not really feel like you need to be tied to any specific career? But when you're saying no to brands because they, you know, they want to negotiate and you don't have time to squabble, you don't want to tussle, as the girls say, um, then how do you, <laughs> I'm tired of it myself. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> we're not sending no more emails. Forget it. <laughs> forget it for, forget it forget it, forget I'm it. Over. you know what <laughs> but, honestly yeah. but how do you then maintain your financial security yeah so it's three things number one i love boundaries and i have them and i'm very clear about what they are i'm clear about what my minimums are um number two i will never devalue myself because i feel like i need money mm-hmm. i will never do that because once you do that there are people will take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, even though there's times where I'm like, I could really use this money right now. I'm like, it's not paying my rate. Mm -hmm. I I had a recent thing come up and a friend was like, but Jessica, you could have made X amount. I'm like, but that's not my rate. I don't care that that is a lot of money because it is a lot of money, but it's not my rate. Okay. And so I have to, you know, even when it's hard, I mean, I've turned down some, very big deals. Like I, I turned down two very big deals yeah. that were six figures. And it's like, who? Oh God. But it's not my rate. It's, you not know? Rate. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Once you start settling, then mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. easier to do it over and over again. And then before you know it, it's like, is that even my rate? <laughs> Because I don't right. ever, I haven't done one campaign at that rate, you know? Exactly. So. And then, and then the third thing that I will say is that I am an investor. Mm. So when that money comes in, you better not go out and buy a Chanel bag. Okay. If you have credit card debt, you better not own anything designer. And that's kind of how I feel about it. Like, mm-hmm. I don't play that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm so happy like that my, my eldest sister, is so into finance and stocks and everything. So for me, it's like my stock portfolio, I mean, RIP to that because of the war in Ukraine. But, you know, I'm I'm like, it's going to keep hope alive, everybody. You know, don't stop. Don't stop investing. Yeah, I mean, you got to be smart, but it's going to come back. Um, So I have money in the stock market, crypto, RIP to that, whatever. Um, (laughs) You know, and then I have, you know, liquid cash or whatever. But also like the other thing is as, side hustle because we're talking about side hustles a lot of those side hustles are 1099 work Mm -hmm. you're not paying taxes let me tell everybody listen right now Mm -hmm. every check you get you better be putting away 35 to 40 percent or you're going to be sad (laughs) big time sad um just put away 40 just to be just put away 40 just just, just in case something (laughs) else happens You you know and and that's real look April 15th just passed. It was so painful. It was so painful. But thank God I had that money sitting in my account because the penalties or what I had to pay would have been insane. So it hurt me to have to move that money and hand it over to somebody when I could have bought a whole damn house. To be able to pay it. Exactly. So it's like, I don't worry about financial security because I've got 
what? My safety net. Mm. So in safety nets, it's everything. It's like your skill set is a safety net. Your obviously finances is a safety mm. net. And just the relationships that you build, all of that is what creates your safety net. I love and it. I don't live, I don't live above my means. I live very very yes. well below my means. I don't oh, have yeah. all the new this, that, and the third, <laughs> but I'm good. Yes. And I remember reading about, I forget what uh, magazine you were featured in for your Detroit home and, you know, reading how, you know, you bought it, it was paid off. I was like, that is go, Jessica. Like that is the goal right there. That's the dream. And I hope everyone listening know. And, you know, if you're a planner and you, you're a side hustler, know that you don't have to go out there and, you know, be this risk taker. Like you can be someone who has a safety net. Matter of fact, I encourage it. <laughs> that is what this show is about. And that's why I bring on amazing women like Jessica. Now we're going to do a quick lightning round before you go. Jessica, are you ready? You just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. All right. So number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Oh, God. Google. <laughs> <laughs> what no, has... legit, legit. Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's been the best business book or podcast episode or live event that you've been to this year? Oh, this year. Eek. Or, okay, or no, no, no. In life. okay, in life. Well, I'll just say the podcast. I love how I built this. Mm-hmm. Number Three, what's a non-negotiable part of your day? <laughs> I just like, saw your face light up. So please tell us what that was. Well, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I'm going to say it anyway. So I like to wind down Candy Crush. Ah, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something like, I'm like, am I going to have to edit this out? <laughs> no, that, you know, it's so funny, but mm-hmm. it is so mindless. And every day when I'm like stressed or I'm like winding down, yeah. I play Candy Crush. I understand. That is very relatable. <laughs> um, number four, what's a personal habit that you think has helped you significantly in your business? Mm, relationship building. And then finally, what is your parting advice for fellow Black women who are listening to this, who want to live a life like you, um, whether that's traveling the world, being their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? You have to believe in yourself, but you have to really believe it. You have to be able to see it. You really have to visualize it. Everything that I have, I saw it. You know what I mean? Like, it's still random. And I'm like, what? Wait, how do we get here? But then I'm like, oh, (laughs) wait, I remember I said this and I did that. And I could see that. And so, like, even now for me, sometimes I see stuff and it's so scary to me because I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, I can't. And then I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is about to happen. And people are like, wait, what? Or I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe I can't believe I got a Grammy for my audio book. And people are like, you got a Grammy for your audio book? I was like, well, it's going to happen next year, but I can't believe it already happened. You know, so <laughs> you really, you have to believe in yourself to the say, point of delusion. Yes, I love that. Really believe in it, y'all. Because a lot of times we say stuff, but we don't actually, actually deep down believe it. You have to convince yourself first. I feel that. Mm-hmm. I feel that. Cause just because right. you're saying the word. Yeah. If you don't feel it, God, the universe whomever they know you lying you're right <laughs> so you have to actually believe it mm-hmm. even though you're saying it you got to believe it and that is the perfect note to end on so where can people connect with you and buy the catch me if you can after this episode yes yeah, so the book is available anywhere books are sold everywhere books are sold so your favorite independent bookseller if you if you on that amazon crack you can get it over there um but as far as connecting with me the best way is definitely on instagram that's where i don't spend a ton of time but that's where i spend the most time on social media. Um, but also through my website you can okay. connect with there as well to catch me if you can.com All right. And we're going to link to all of those in the show notes. And guys, remember that you can also check this episode out on YouTube. Go over to youtube.com slash Side Hustle Pro or just search Side Hustle Pro. So thank you, Jessica, for being in the guest chair. Um, You know, I always start out with things that I want to ask, but this interview took some wonderful turns and I'm really glad that we had this discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Nikayla. Welcome. And there you have it. 
Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six bullet Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you'll receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon. Thank you.